Well, here we are, Dean. Here we are, Hello. Martin. Dean Martin. Hello, audience. It's the Dean Martin Show. There's only <laughs> certain people that'll get that reference, but a certain oh, I hope age more group. More than a few people. Yeah. So, welcome, um, everyone. I am back. Dean's going to help me um, in this my first show back since open heart surgery, and uh, I am feeling great. And again, I want to thank everyone out there for. Uh, the nice emails and messages and every which way it got to me. So uh, somehow some people got my cell phone and were texting me. All good. I uh, It was all good. And Dean, I want to thank you very much for uh, filling in for me. You did an excellent job. Uh, last week, I, I received a bunch of emails. Uh, what a stellar job you, you did. So well, thank you. And, I, and I'll pass on the thanks to my mother for all those emails. Yeah, that's um, right. <laughs> what's happening here with me? Is this what happens, Martin? When you yes, work on the I, show for 10 years, you, you yeah, eventually you use the goatee. Yeah, you get you, the goatee because I'm, I'm, it's happening. It's a natural thing. I can't stop yeah. this thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's um, oh, you're shaving and it keeps coming, right? It keeps coming yeah. in. Um, yeah. I just also want to say um, that I am so happy to see uh, your smiling cherubic face <laughs> back where you belong <laughs> in the saddle, my friend. And, um, yeah. Uh, again, it was uh, it was fun, but it was also um, um, really kind of um, a, a wonderful experience. Um, well, you know, I'd like to invite you back now and then to co-host because uh, I think we could have some fun. And, uh, you know, if you get that special guest that I can't get, then uh, you can guilt me into it anytime. Oh, guilt is a so, great motivator. I'm, I'm it there. is. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I want to say uh, this week's blog by Charles Lear is part two of behind the scenes of the UFO cover up live. That was a uh, series that aired back in the 1980s. I also want to give a shout out because uh, when I was in the hospital, um, I shared a room with several different people. But the last guy I shared a room with named Rick, uh, the poor guy is still in there. He's had a really rough go of it. And I've been out of the hospital since I think the 8th of October. October, I believe that's when I got out, something like that. <clears throat> so anyway, uh, it's funny. I was sitting there, uh, I don't reading or something, and I happened to look up over at Rick's TV, and I saw Leslie Kane, and then I saw UFOs flying around. And so uh, I kind of interrupted a show and said, hey, uh, you into UFOs? And by golly, he knows Every, he knows a lot about UFOs. I mean, all these cases. He knows about Rendlesham Forest. Um, you know, he he was very well versed. He's been watching you, Dean, um, and he's probably watching tonight right from the hospital. Is, so, is he the guy that holds up the scorecards that says two, three out of ten? Is that him? Yeah, yeah that's okay. the guy. Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, it's really funny because uh, you and I have talked about this, how we will be just doing the usual traveling that our jobs take us. And occasionally, you know, you're seated next to someone or it'll come up. Ideally it's organic. Um, and, and I'm, I swear to God, I, I would say the odds are, you know, eight out of 10 people I talk to are totally down with it into it. Um, and then I have to do, I don't know if you do this, but I do like a gauging. How far are they in the rabbit hole? What, what side of the rabbit hole are they? And uh, and then, you know, kind of try to recouch and say, oh, you might want to stay a little more in this one than that one, because, as yeah. you know, there's you know, tons yeah. of. Uh, yeah, because holes. people people are when they're looking at it from the outside, they can certainly go down the wrong path and uh, take something that's real. We won't have to go into exactly that right now. No, but <laughs> <laughs> but but anyway, it feels it feels really good to be back. And uh, again, um I'm thrilled to be back and I feel like I have a new life and I'm very grateful. Um, it's, I could have actually dropped, um, you know, and that would have been the end of it. But uh, I, I was able to catch something in time, a 95% blockage um, with a bypass. So I was right there. So uh, I'm very, very grateful. Yeah. Well, again, I think all of the love that was sent to you, I think that stuff matters. I think it really yeah. does all the great energy that you were getting sent. And uh, I, I, I can see um, I can just see the difference from you because I've been able to be there right before you had the operation right after and charting That's right. it. And uh, right you, were the doing, pains. Yeah. you were doing great, my friend. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. You know, I think we should probably talk about our guest. That yeah, might sure. not be a bad idea. Why not? Uh, John Burroughs. 
Uh, he's been on the show several times, but many years ago, and I'm really looking forward uh, to talking to him again tonight. And uh, as you know, I, I shouldn't pick any favorites on the air, but uh, as Bill said earlier, John is his favorite in the uh, Bill who works behind the scenes in KGRA said he's definitely the favorite of all the people that he's talked to involved in the Rendlesham Force. A solid guy. He was, I believe, the second person to see the UFO the first night uh, when it was there. Right. Back in 1980, the Rendlesham Force. Uh, we'll go into a nutshell of that. It seems like I had something else to say. But uh, again, I'm not exactly 100% right there. I know uh, James Fox will be on next week. Uh, I wanted to, and I'll be in a hotel room, but um, it'll be good to have him on to talk about his new uh, uh, moment of contact, right? And you saw that at the studio. Uh, you saw it at the theater. I saw it at the LA premiere and uh, yeah. on the big screen. And if you get a chance to see it um, on the big screen, jump at it. Uh, I know that it's been playing in uh, South America. They had a premiere in Brazil and it was this wow. big, big news event um, because all these people that have been tracking this story are now going taking ownership you know, in Brazil, taking ownership of this. And so um, it's really nice to, to see that recognition and see those people kind of um, transition from this mythic thing to credibility from another country that came in and, and you know, gave it uh, a new yeah. varnish on it. So, yeah, yeah it's really, really uh, good. He, he crushed it. James yeah, Moore. and there's a lot of, of things going on in the UFO world, UFO news lately. I don't know if we'll be able to touch on that or not, but I'm going to bring him in now. John Burroughs, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me back. Yeah, yeah, Ben. I I think it's been like four or five years, something. I think the last time I took I did is your show was in fifteen. Two thousand fifteen. I think so. That was when Hall. Oh, wow. Remember when Colonel Hall joined us? Yes, I, I do think, remember that. I think that was the last time I've been on with you. Yeah, uh, that was a very popular show. It got a lot, a lot of hits. Yeah, when the Colonel and I join up together, it gets interesting. I could tell you that much. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. How's everything going for you, John? Doing well. How about you? I mean, well, obviously you just talked about it, so I'm yeah. glad you're getting better. So, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel I feel really great. Um, so, uh, John, I know you've told the story a million times, but uh, we have this thing happening where there's a lot of new people that are just because of all UFOs being more normalized. There's all new people coming in constantly. I get a lot of email. So, in a nutshell, can you explain? What happened and what you were involved in in uh, the incident? Um, sure, it's the it, it started out being <clears throat> called the uh, Aria Bentwaters incident, and then it went to the Reynolds Forest. It happened over our incident happened over a three night period over Christmas of 1980. Um, there was stuff that happened prior and after, and the prior stuff could go back years. They actually had. I think in the 50s, they had a weird incident take place where they actually chased something with fighter planes. But in a nutshell, it was a three-night period. First night, I was on duty. It was our last midnight shift. We came on at 11, about 3 o'clock in the morning. I was riding with uh, my supervisor, who was new to the base, who wanted to talk to me a little bit about just meet up and talk. So I jumped in the stroke car. We were driving around. We were down by the gate. You saw some strange lights in the sky going into the forest. He asked me if I'd seen anything like that. I'd been there a year and a half before, and I said no. So from that point, uh, we decided we take a – I don't know how to put this the other way. We just decided to open the gate and go out to the end of the road to get a better idea of what could be going on because we really didn't want to call anything in until we had a better grasp of it. Once we got down to the end of the hour, the road, things didn't seem right. Came back up, called it in on the phone at the gate. They sent a security patrol down. They saw it too. The, uh, they did some uh, research from CSC to with the different radars, and they came up the uh, correlation that something was on radar over the area and went down into the forest. We uh, then proceeded, uh, the two security guys and I went into the got into the vehicle and went into the forest to try to see if we could figure out what was going on. We uh, eventually got close to something. The stories all differ from there. I remember getting close, then it was gone. Uh, the security supervisor said he went up to it, touched it, saw glyphs, 
got a binary download, walked around it for 45 minutes. The third guy who Penniston tried to outright just write out of the story, but later admitted he was there. He remembered getting, we got close to him, blacked out. At that point, we, um, it disappeared. We went, we went on into the fields and farther out towards the coast, saw some lights again, and then it was gone. So that was night one. Night two, they had uh, something seen in the forest. Shift commander went out with the on-duty security uh, flight chief. They had some kind of encounter that's never been totally um, straightened out just because she's never willing to talk about it. Night three is when I went out on my own after finding out about night two with a couple other guys. We were on break and met up with the halt party. And that was the night when um, I met up with them and Bistens and I went forward and we had some kind of interaction with whatever it was. And um, there was, uh, there was, I remember, I, I, I don't know if it was you that told me or I'm remembering something where um, you kind of woke up and from, you were standing and it was like, near it or something well that was night three when adrian and i uh when it came towards us the whole party and for years a lot of people would question why i didn't get talked about very much was because colonel hall denied any of that happened he uh, at, at the beginning denied that adrian and i were even involved then the bruni tape came out the tape that he made bruni got her hands on georgina bruni and it actually modified it cleaned it up and right there my name and Bistenz's name were on the tape so he couldn't deny we were out there. Then he tried to poo-poo what we did. But eventually, through different things, we were able to prove not only were we there, but we, went, we were allowed to go forward to get close to it. And as I was going towards it, Adrian said, well, we were running, and he went down right before, before I actually it came over me, and I disappeared in it. So I, I just remember getting close to it and it was there and gone. Adrian actually saw me go into it and disappear. Um, I'm really interested in, in the moment when you and uh, uh, Penniston, uh, Jim, and uh, the third officer, it was you, Jim. Ed Kabanzak. And, and, and yeah, Ed, yeah. When you came across it, um, Jim talks about, and I've been really curious and wanted to ask you this. When Jim talks about coming across it, he says it felt like everything in the forest became quiet. All the, the insects, all the, the night sounds seemed to die out. And then he said at some point, he felt like there was almost like it was, he describes it as walking through um, like water. It seemed a little bit labored to walk through a little bit in slow motion. He was kind of trying to dial in the right expression. And he said he could see you guys on the peripheral that you were looking at this while he went up and got closer. And he describes his experience. Um, but I'm curious to get what your experience was because I'm a, I'm a believer that you can have different experiences. Doesn't mean it cancels out the other person's experience, but I'm curious what your experience was during that. It, it doesn't necessarily cancel out the experience, but the issue is this. He tried to write Ed out completely, and eventually he did an interview where he admitted he was right there with us because Ed and I do not have anything, any kind of recollection of any of that taking place. And you're right. It doesn't mean it didn't happen. It's just as that the story with him has grown over the years to where at the very beginning he basically said, well, a statement said we got close to it, and that was it. What I can say – for clearly what Ed and I remember was we got close to it. He blacked out. He claimed he did that in the James Fox documentary. I know what I saw. He said we got close to it and then he blacked out. We all blacked out is what he remembered. Um, but he did say I drew my weapon, which I don't remember having a weapon with me at the time. But yeah. then I just remember getting close to it and then it was gone. You know, it was like it, was, it went away. There it was and it was gone. So as far as Penniston's story, I mean, you're right. We can all remember different things, but there are other caveats to it that come in question a little bit about how he's raised the bar on what happened. So. Sure. I just now, want to you, Oh, go ahead, Mark. No, weren't you not allowed to take weapons when you went off the base? That was the, um, okay, that was the original 
assumption. Well, what I mean by that was we, when he came off the phone, he said for us to leave all our, we were told to leave our weapons with Stephens at the patrol car. And that's what I remember. But Kabansak claims I drug took my 38 with me and I actually <laughs> drew it. So I, I don't remember having my weapon with me or drawing it. And I even joked about it in the Fox documentary. I said, well, what good it would it have been if I had it and I would have drawn it and fired at it? I, yeah. I don't think it would have went well for us. Maybe, you know, so. Yeah, um, I wouldn't want to do it. Yeah. I, I want to um, back up. When you say that uh, originally Jim had felt that he had passed out. And was that your recollection as well? And what did that look like? Did he go no, into a No, 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 his statement. Blacked out. He, his statement was, he just said that his statement was written by, for him by somebody else. At, the statements got released. Then this, that was what was going on. And then then he came back and said, no, I did all this other stuff. And then he said the statement was written for him, and that wasn't the truth. <laughs> and all I'm saying is, is that over the years, he's added to the story over and over. And it's hurt the incident because no no notebook for 20 years. Then it shows up on the 20-year mark. Then the notebook has the glyphs in it. And then at the 30-year mark, then the notebook, then he adds the, the binary. So all I'm trying to say is, is that Ed and I got close to it, and we don't really know what happened. So all my question is, and there's other things that we could talk about it, but I question some of what he he has said about what he, happened to him, just from knowing him, being around him in the event itself. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, again, we're talking... Oh, how many years ago? Uh, we're it's talking 42, 42 years. years. It'll be yeah. 40, yeah, 42 yeah. years. So, yeah, uh, but this all happened. He started coming out with this in around 2000. And, and the reason why I say some of this, if you do your history of Rendlesham, he, we did a piece, Halt, him and I went over to England for, I know it was a, called, um, ugh, this is my senior time. We did a piece over in England where they, he, Penniston and Halt had just gotten out and I was still in the reserves. And we went over there and we did a piece and he didn't talk about any of that. He didn't talk about the notebook. And when I challenged him on that, he claims that he offered the notebook to the crew. And I'm like, Jim, I was there for the production meetings. You did not do that. And he, and he said, well, they didn't want, they weren't interested in this. They're going to fly us 3000 miles and you're going to come up with this notebook. that's going to show what happened. You wrote down all this stuff and they're not going to be interested in it or use it in the show. You know what I mean? You know, so there's just a lot of discrepancies. And I, I feel it's hurt the incident because there's a following behind it, but there's nothing to back up what he said other than what he said, where the rest of us have stuck to what we remember and stayed that way from, from the beginning. I've never tried to embellish on night one or three. I just said, this is what I remember. And I got attacked for that, that I was covering up stuff. So, yeah. I can see that happening. I want to ask you this, John. Um, how much did this look like the craft? This picture no, that's up there. There was there was just lights. All I ever saw was lights. I see. So you never actually saw a structured craft. No, never saw a structured craft. Now my hypnosis, I do use the word craft, but I I, I never could describe it, and it was not. I never saw anything triangular. That's all I'm going to say. Never saw anything triangular. So. You said, did you say hypnosis? Yeah. So what was the, what was the difference between your memory of this and then the main points and then after hypnosis? Well, nothing really. I mean, hypnosis kind of expanded a little bit about what took place, but it, it nothing really changed. That was why it was done in 88 was because I didn't remember what happened when I got close to it. But then the hypnosis expanded on what we were dealing with. And I've never, ever, ever tried to say anything more than if I'm asked about the hypnosis, I'll lay it out what the hypnosis said. But I don't intermix the hypnosis with what I remember. Yeah. Yeah. I'm always interested how, like, Jim's in my, um, uh, my new documentary project. And the way that, that he had described it was kind of like, stuff would come in ways where you would have this. He was up obviously closer than, than, you know, you guys were. Um, and a not lot really, of, not really, no, See, no? he was, he was, maybe two or, he was maybe a couple feet. We were like in a line 
staggered line formation. He was there. I was there. And then Ed was by me. And if you go back and listen to the last interview we did with Jimmy Church, he admitted that. But he's mm-hmm. always said otherwise before. But Jimmy caught him off guard. He asked him a clear question. He goes, so the three of you, when you were coming up on the berm, what, what, what happened? And then he described exactly where we were, what we were doing and everything. Before, he's always tried to deny Ed was there because Ed's story and mine correlate more than his does. Both of your guys joined. Yes, him, right? yes. Interesting. So, and, and, and then just, okay, the binary itself. And this is one of the, I was around when that took place, okay? It came out in a shooting in Glendale. We were working with Linda Moulton Howe and Prometheus Entertainment, which did the, which did the show, um, you know, uh, uh, the, what is it? What is the one? Ancient Aliens. Me? Ancient Aliens, right? He never showed. And Hall had said he'd handled the remote. James Fox had said he'd handled the notebook. Never saw the binary ever in it. Other people had looked at that notebook too. Now, when he brought it out there, I had questioned he had the wrong date. So he had the date that matched the Halt memo. I said, bring the notebook and let's look at it. Now, I thought I'd get to see it the night before to understand it. Didn't bring it up when we met for a little bit. On set, we're sitting there at the table and, and he hands me the notebook and I'm looking at it. And all of a sudden, these ones and zeros are there. And it fits perfectly to the ancient alien hypothesis which at the point they were only going to do a 15 minute segment and then go over and do a documentary on the 30 years. Well, they changed the whole show to an hour long, but here's the kicker. The, uh, the binary codes identify specific areas. Okay. So like if you go on the, the NASCAR lines, it's an area on the NASCAR lines, right? Well, those codes were found because there was a guy doing an investigation on this because he was interested in China. That was the weird one, right? Right. He found all the codes on an ancient website that had been out three years before Peniston even came forward with the binary. The same exact zeros and ones? Yes, or the a section same of it? Well, see, there's a problem it's with that, long, too. pretty long, right? Yeah, no, but see, where you put the decimal point is where the point will be on the site, okay? So you could put Sedona could be of the burial mounds farther down from Sedona. But the exact points on this ancient site match the sites that they deciphered. And stuff. And then all, the only excuse they gave was the site had been hacked to discredit his story. Mm. They couldn't, it, it just, there's just too many discrepancies with this whole thing that just, that Reynoldson doesn't need that. Reynoldson happened. The government tried to act like they weren't covering it up, but they did. And there's so much more we can go into why I can show you they covered it up without all this other stuff coming out, which, again, if he had come out with that notebook right away, say he held it until he got out and then did it all, more believable. But why wait for the 20 and 30-year mark? Mm-hmm. And then well, the codes being found and the glyphs were found on, on equipment that was being sold in Germany. See, these guys, that when he came out with this, there were some hardcore people that looked into this stuff. And they were just like, oh, wait a minute. This stuff, this wasn't me doing it. It's just the facts started coming out that a lot of this just doesn't add up. But you people can believe what they want. And, and there is a cult following behind the binary. But, I, I mean, that's that's here and there. I mean, really, the, the truth of the matter is our incident and how it affected people health-wise and what it means in the grand scheme of what we're dealing with going forward to include to the modern day. Now, about the health effects, um, if Penniston was the closest one to the object, I'm, I've never really heard him speak of any. He did, and then he backed off on it. Um, when we did the hearings in Steve Bassett, the, the citizens' hearings, yeah. well, that was my approach. I, I didn't go in with the typical approach. I went in with the human factor, the injuries, and I had evidence to support it including that my my document, my files were classified. And when they saw that, they really jumped on it. And he even admitted he was getting disability and had some issues with his heart and some other things. And then when the CIA guy showed up later, after that, that's when he tried to walk a lot of it back. But he's on tape saying that he had issues, health issues from it. And not, he wasn't the closest to it. And I'm just going off of the reason why people question why didn't he get as sick as I did well, if you believe what Adrian said, and I say that not because I don't believe him, but I just got close to it. Adrian saw me go in and disappear. Now, if that's the case, then I went into it. 
I didn't just get close to it. I've got an eyewitness saying I went into it. Where Peniston doesn't have anybody supporting the story other than himself. Well, according to his book that I've been reading a little bit of, uh, the recent really huge book, I got it right over there. The Randall Shem yeah. Enigma. Uh, yeah. It's yeah. an enigma, all right. Uh, but he, he was saying, stating in that book that you were right behind him. I was. I was right behind him. I told you, a couple of feet. You were right behind him, and he's like at the craft, and you didn't see the craft. No. So, wow. Okay. So It's, it's interesting. Sorry, go ahead, Martin. No, I'm done. I was just going to add that um, there have been many times when, um, when, when people have seen craft and others had, have not. And they're standing yeah, but next I, I to saw, each other. I saw something. I, I, I did it in my statement. Now, the question is, I'm not challenging everything he said. I'm just saying you have to look at the consistency of the notebook, the glyphs, the binary, and how its stories expanded. And it's expanded with no corroborating evidence or anybody else backing it up. Right. That's all I'm saying. It's another thing was I have somebody that's not, I didn't say I went into it. I have somebody that saw me go into it, you know? Peniston said I was, at one point he said, he testified or didn't testify, but made a statement that he saw the light come over me and engulf me. I never said any of that. Okay. I don't remember that. I never claimed to remember that. I never changed my story. But when someone starts adding stuff on and there's nobody else to corroborate it, there should be further investigation on it and not just taking it for their word. And just like the notebook. Notebook would have come out right away fine. Or even at the 20-year mark, the binary end. But how come nobody saw the binary till the 30-year mark? Well, he claims because he kept it out. Well, then if he didn't want it out, why did he bring it so Prometheus could look at it? Which fell right into their uh, wheelhouse. Right. They made an hour piece on him being the Messiah. When I saw the piece, they showed it to us beforehand, I just shook my head. I, I ticked Kim Sharon off. I said, boy, you screwed this case. I said, you've turned this guy into the Messiah, you know, mm. and, and it did. The whole show was unbelievable. Hmm. The story wow. that I had heard was that he was showing the crew the book. They showing were me the book, the, not the, the notebook. Crew, me. Me. You on yes. location, right? Yes. And then he was going through it and then he was rifling through it. And towards the end, they had the, the, the zeros and ones and... I think Linda, I'm not sure if it was Linda or Jim, say, they were like, well, what, what's that? And no, they all, I did. I said, what is this? Then they all jumped on it. But see, that's even where he's made up a story on that. He claimed that he was forced into this later. That's not the truth. As soon as they saw it, they went back and re-interviewed him for like two and a half hours. He openly and agreeably went through the interview and allowed it to go into the show. Do you yeah. understand what I mean? He never could even get the amount of pages he had straight forever. It was 13, 16, this, that, whatever. There's people that claim that he added stuff to it later. All I'm getting at is the incident's real. There's a lot of people that don't like the incident because of that. And I, I don't totally disagree with it. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. There's no supporting evidence other than what he claims. And again, why did he put it in his notebook if he never wanted it out? He put it in there so Prometheus would see it. Because he claimed God. that's why Fox... And Halt never saw it. They never saw it because they went through the notebook because he never had it in there because it's a loose leaf notebook. John, what's the book that you wrote? Uh, I think you wrote it with Nick Pope, right? Uh, was and, and Peniston. And Peniston. Yeah. What was yeah. the name of that book? And would you recommend that book? Or what Encounters of Reynolds and Forest. Um, it's a vanilla version um, of what happened. Uh, Nick wanted to write it that way because he wanted to follow the Leslie King met, um you know, method of putting out generalizations and stuff, hoping that if things move forward with all everything going on, this book would catch on, you know, as far as, you know, and, and if you notice, there's very little in the binary about it. And even Nick even challenged the binary in the book. So, hmm. Hmm. so, so go ahead. I'm just saying it, it, it did well. I mean, it sold well. It was encounters in Reynolds and Forest. Um, there was too much left out, in my opinion. And what I mean by left out was he didn't, Nick refused to really expand on Project Condine, which is a key to a lot of what's going on to this day. So right. I didn't like that part of it. I, you know, I just never agreed with 
the fact that he always like Nick likes to hold things in the rears to use it as bait, in my opinion, a lot of times. So, yeah. Well, I've uh, I've always said that this incident is in my top five incidents when people ask me, you know, what what are your what is what do you think is the really you know top five incidents? This is one of them, and one of the uh, things I'm wondering if you're aware of. Supposedly, there's a mandate that the uh, uh, what's it called, uh, Dean? That the UFO Mm, help me here. The, yeah. the, what they're doing, the government research, there's a hearing coming up. Oh, the, the, the congressional hearings that have been going on where they're, yeah. they've got the, UF, the UAP task force. Well, that's the old name for it. But anyway, it's it's oh, then, that yeah. that more or less. But they have a mandate that um, I saw, you know, I saw parts of it in documents for next year to in 2023 to look at cases from 1940. I think 1940 forward. And I think when this involves a military case, they're definitely going to be uh, looking well, to that one. Well, here's the thing. Okay. I, I have to be careful what I say because I've spoken to people inside Congress about this. Oh, and, and I, um, I can say this, they're not getting any cooperation from the intelligence agencies. So there may be a mandate that, they're supposed to release information to them. But at the point when I spoke to them, what they were given was basically nothing. There were, mm -hmm. there was no cooperation coming from the intelligence agencies and the military. Uh, I believe that Navy was semi cooperative, but the air force was just a dug in their heels and were refusing. Then if you follow this further, the uh, uh, DOD said, they're not going to release any more video or anything because it'll give up means and measures. So there's not, there's really nothing that they're going to get from these agencies, at least at this point. Hmm. Well, the, um, the, the one leg bit of legislation that, that is the whistleblower one, as it's referred to in, in as many as, uh, uh, in other terms as well, is that hasn't been passed yet. So well, you know, it was passed. It just hadn't been signed. Hasn't been signed. So and that's a weird thing in itself. Why yeah. has it taken so long to sign? I can tell you this, and I'll let you answer the question. The whistleblower act's not going to change anything. If what I if I knew something about Reynoldson that's classified, unless the handler that's handling the case allows me to talk about it, I'm violating my security oath in you know, as far as national security goes, okay? And one of the questions I ask, and I'm not going to go into too much detail other than I challenge why Lou has not testified yet to somebody that's involved. And I was told that he's not going to be allowed to testify because the people involved with this stuff aren't going to release, allow him to talk about it. They're not going to release the, 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 allow the data that he's aware of to be declassified to talk about. So yeah. this whole whistleblower act, if it's classified, you can't just, it doesn't give me a right to just go and, and talk about it. No. And the point I wanted to make is that as soon as, a, as an event happens, they don't go like SETI, which is supposed to go to the public because it's a public, basically, you know, uh, a sponsored program. And so they have, and, and Seth uh, so Shostak has talked about this. It, it goes right to the media and the media does their own version of that and puts their own spin on it. Whereas if something happens uh, and you're in the military, it goes up to your commander. That's how that happens. No matter what, even if it's uh, there's someone, you know, spilled a mop and, and you trip, you're not going to go out and say this. So it still is going to be filtered. So I, that, that wasn't very impressive for me as far as, you know, the whistleblower thing. Um, you're, you're right. I mean, we can't, and I'm, the mop thing's a little, kind of overboard but like for example when when Rendlesham finally got out or Ben was Ben was incident at the time got out um I had no idea about it I I was completely caught off guard my phone started ringing um and I I there were like all over the world was calling me I, I first of all I wonder how they got my number because it wasn't even under my name it was under my roommate's name but they they've tracked me down and I blew all of them off until CNN called Mm -hmm. And then at that point, and he told me he was coming out to Phoenix to interview me. So at that point, I had to go to public affairs. And the, the 
public affairs handled it through the Pentagon, and I had to speak to the Pentagon about what I could and could say about the incident before I could go and talk to him. Yeah. So there, it's not just, oh, they signed this thing, and now, oh, John, you can come up and talk to us now. No, no, I can't. Yeah. I, I can come up there. And if it's a classified briefing where it's behind closed doors, then I can talk. But pu- do go go in front of a pu- the public and a public hearing? No, I can't do that. And even then, I'm going to have to get permission to talk about it inside the classified hearing. You know, on top of in that hearing, what did they ask? One of the questions asked was, "Have we developed technology off of UAP?" Well, we'll take that behind closed doors. So anything of value, people think disclosure is coming. Anything of value, if it's if it's deemed national security, where you and I or anybody else agrees with it, if it falls under that and heading, it's good luck trying to get it out. You know what I mean? Wow. Uh, so if you um, right after this happened, uh, what was what was the fallout like? Was there indeed a, a drug used? Um, that that that's something I've heard a lot over the years. And was were you were you? I mean, can you even talk about it? Were you? No, I, for me, for me, here's the thing. I, I remember they eventually we went home, went on a three day break. When I came back Monday, they had me write a statement to turn into the wing staff on Tuesday. I would have been the wing king, the base commander, and then Colonel Halt was involved. Um, went in, handed my statement in, which has been made public. That got released. Um, eventually, but went in, stood there in, in line, me, Kapansak, and Penniston. Penniston was the ranky guy, did all the talking, got told that they were looking into it. they get back to us if they needed anything from us, and to go, we're dismissed. Now, Penniston's gone on the record claiming he was interrogated. It's interesting that at first he, he never remembered the, the Sony and Panathol and all that until he went under hypnosis. He just said that Halt talked to him quite a bit about it, but then after the hypnosis that he did, then his story started kind of intermixing where it went from this is hypnosis memory, this is what I remember, to this is kind of the story now. You know, but in reality, um, uh, Basinda said he was called in and interrogated. Um, so, yes, there is some people that have stated they were intimidated, interrogated, and possibly they had... Um, Hypnosis or sodium pentothal used on it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if were you told like point blank, do not talk about this? I no, because I wasn't talking to the wing staff. Do you understand what I mean? Penniston was doing the talking and he was told we were kind of told, we were kind of just told informed that what this is what I remember. We're looking into it. If we need something from me, we'll let you know you're dismissed. So you weren't told, like, do not talk about this to anyone, basically? No, I mean, but we weren't going to talk about it. It was a, it was already a cardinal rule. Do you understand what I mean? We were involved in an incident, and we're just not allowed to go out and talk about an incident. There are ramifications if you're involved in an incident. Like, it doesn't matter if it's a UFO. It can just be an incident where I was involved. If I go talking about it, I'm, I can be held accountable for it. Well, I'm I'm really curious about the whole um, OSI because okay. you had, yeah you had mentioned the Navy I mean every every military force has their own um, mountain that they've claimed you know for themselves and it's always been a challenge um, whenever something happens where what is the universal agreement on things I mean it's a long you know history of this. But it seems like the Air Force has been, especially once it was, you know, created after World War II, that um, that it, this seems to be presided recited over them, the, the phenomenon, if you will. And OSI specifically keeps coming up time and time again, where they come and do the questioning and, and move on. Did you, when you were debriefed, did you talk to anyone from the that specific office? Well, again... The only debrief, if you want to call it that, was we talked to shift commander after we got off the first night, and I stood in front of the the wing commander and the base commander and Colonel Hall, and I wrote a statement. I, I do not remember. Other people claim they saw me get brought in. If I'm not denying that it couldn't have happened. I just don't remember it happening. You know what I mean? So could I have been 
you know, worked over. Maybe what I do know is that if the book I wrote myself, I wrote with James Warrow, and uh, there was different contributing authors in it, including the lawyer that was involved in my settlement with the government, the staffer from McCain's office, um, that that I don't I don't even know how to explain it. It's just it's just. Well, it's I, fascinating because I'm listening to you right now, and you you you're speaking with um, with. Um, such conviction because I know that this this experience, this part of the journey of your life has been in some ways co-opted by people or rewritten, which history that's always going on, right? Right. And so, but there are areas that are a little bit kind of foggy where there are witnesses that say this and even for yourself, it's kind of like I was there, but I'm, I'm not sure the disappearing thing, I don't remember. It, it sounds like, well, I mean, again, well, we're talking 42 years ago. Yeah, well, yeah, but we are, but here's the thing. When I wrote the book, Weapons, Weaponizations, an OSI guy, I got through another OSI guy, wrote, a, wrote me an email, it's in the book, telling me how he, this is how it, when it happened. Now, I confirmed this with Colonel Halt, that this OSI guy was there and involved, and he confirmed it. And when I let him read the email, Halt didn't deny it. Hmm. You know, he didn't deny what the guy said took place, that there was intelligence agencies brought in, they were they were concerned about there was an anomaly always showed up before our events happened. They brought the NSA in to try to figure out what that anomaly was. There was all kinds of things going on to include that the fact that there was all kinds of top secret testing going on right outside the back gate to include the fact that there was a phenomenon being studied by the British government. That that was confirmed by Andrew Pike that was involved in the study. Now, he gets mad if I say he was doing it with the, uh, the British government, but it was funded by the British government through the university that he was conducting this phenomenon, and he wrote a book about it. So the point being is, is there was all kinds of stuff going on. There was also the Cold War. The Russians, the, the, the OSI guy claimed it was probably, they were concerned at first it may have been some kind of Russian thing going on. He even stated that the Russians, we... And this was something that never went public, but there was a couple of Russian agents that got caught out there at the time. Now, that didn't come from me. That came from the OSI guy. So you take it from what you want to take. Well, just in the context of history, we're talking December 1980. Yeah. So that's smack dab at the beginning, the, the going from first to second gear with Reagan, who's in office. And and he throws down, you know. I'm not sure when he made the. No, quota. Reagan did. No, no, Reagan didn't get inaugurated oh, right, until January. Carter right, was till, Carter was the president at the time. Yeah. Till January. Okay, that's a, that's an important distinction. So so at that moment, it it the relationship hadn't been checked. Like when Reagan came and called him the evil empire, coining the Star Wars uh, 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 term. But it was definitely Cold War was definitely hot and heavy. So that's not out of the realm of them being a, a presence of them being there. But I'm, I'm curious, and I asked Jim this question, and it's, why do you think this happened? And, and I'm interested in the two levels. One is just in a procedural way of, of why this might have happened. And, but the second is, you know, looking at it from, uh, from their perspective, what would you know from, from whomever this okay, technology well, was? We're, yeah. we're going to run out of time here. So I want to get into the, the key part that we may not be able to cover is my what the way the government have treated me with my injuries. Okay. Sure. Now the procedural part was people have speculated the base knew what was going on. I don't think they did at least on the first night. There's been some stuff sustained that later on the Williams may have got briefed or not got briefed. Okay. But at first I don't think they knew. So they didn't really know what to deal with it. But down the road, I think as things started happening, um, that, the, the the higher ups in our base chain of command started figure you know being briefed on what was going place. You have to look at the bay outside the gate what was going on in Marlstrom Heath, Aria Fauzi, and some of these other facilities that were out there, including Marconi, which was a defense contractor that was working on stuff out there, and the fact that they were actually studying this phenomenon that's still there to this day. The, these are things that are real. I mean. You can't, I'm not telling you exactly what the phenomenon is, but it was even in Condine, which was part of my settlement with the government, that stated that we were exposed to UAP radiation. Okay, so the guy that authored this actually was an engineer that worked inside the defense industry and the MOD. Um, 
said that we were exposed to UAP radiation. Now, the interesting thing was when I got sick, because before I got sick, I was just trying to get people together to see if we could get a better piece of the whole the whole thing, right? Let's get together 30th. Let's try to get as many people. Halt didn't want Warren, Larry Warren involved and some other people. So it turned into a big mess, but Pennison and I were working together. And so we went over there, did everything. Some strange things happened, which we can maybe go in later. But when I came back, I got sick. And, and I'd gotten sick right after the incident when I started having some health issues and I ended up going to Wright Patterson afterwards, which I didn't know the ramifications of it at the time. But later you find out that's where they do a lot of work on, you know, uh, technology and all that other stuff. But that's where they went and they discovered some issues and they were going to monitor it. OK, fast forward to after 2010 and 11, my heart started getting really bad. My civilian doctors wanted to look at all the testing they did back at Wright Patterson when the whole heart issue became identified. Now, people say, well, I would have had the heart problem before. No, you couldn't get in the Air Force with the issues I had. And I actually had a physical, a copy of my physical showing I was clean bill of health when I came in. Okay. So all my records and stuff were denied. So to access to, went to Senator Kyle. He put a request in. They came back to him and said, my my document, my files, my personnel files and my medical records, what where they belong. Okay. I've got all the proof of this. This isn't hearsay. I've got all the documents supporting this. So the A came back and said, well, what's going on here is your, your files are classified. I've dealt with this in other incidents, including Agent Orange, which tells me your files are classified. So you need to go file a disability and that'll force an issue. So when filed disability, came back, went in for my um, interview for my disability. The doctor challenged me on everything I said happened. She says, you weren't in the Air Force at the time. And I'm like, what do you mean I wasn't? She goes, your records don't show you being in the military. Uh. And sure enough, she completed her stuff. And they came back. And I have the letters denying my claim because I was not in the Air Force in 1979 and 80. 81 until 1982. They had used a different DD-4214 and they claimed there was nothing in my medical records or personnel files, which, by the way, what little they could get their hands on showed that I, there was nothing in there about from 79 to 82. Wow. So at that point, um, Kyle was retiring and McCain took it over. And so they started working on this. And, and this is in the book. The, the staffer went to FRPC and said, wait a minute, this guy was in. We have pay records. We have proof. He's got proof. They said, no, he wasn't in. Well, what about the records he has? They're not certified. We're not going to accept them. So I got around it by calling retirement and said, how can I be retired if they're claiming I wasn't in? Well, the girl helped me, got some stuff to McCain. Then they could prove I was in. Then there was supposed to be a settlement. And then somebody way up killed it. It's all in the book. It was all laid out what what happened with the staffer and everything and the whole thing in the department of justice got in the middle of and all of this. So this is real. They were denying I was in the air force. They were denying I was injured while I was in the air force and they were denying my injuries. But eventually through a hard work of Senator McCain and his staff and everything else, I, I did get my settlement and people claim, well, that wasn't because of the incident. My whole claim was based off. I was injured in the line of duty in the forest during the event. And they acknowledged it, and they gave me my disability for that incident. Now, Adrian Bastenza, he too has 100% disability, or 95%, I think it is, for our event and the injuries he sustained in the forest with me on night three. So two of us have been acknowledged by the government that we were injured in the line of duty during the event. Did that happen at the same time? No, but things that happened afterwards because I had all the, the documents that got him in through real quick. His I, was done in less than six months. Mine took two and a half years, which is light time in VA <laughs> the disability settlements. Right. Wow. Yeah. So there's all kinds of cover-ups going on with what happened to us. Now, what I've been clear to say, which ticks people off, is I don't know what a UAP is. I'd like to find out. I don't know for sure what happened to us. I'd like to find out. But it was made clear to me all along by the staffer, Kyle, 
about his staffers and, and with uh, McCain was, they're going to get me the care I deserve, but I was never going to get close to what happened. That was going to stay locked down forever. Mm. So it's kind of like, uh, what is the most important battle to win here? Um, and that is getting you health care. And the other stuff becomes secondary, and and that's your number one goal for yourself. Is well, I was dying. I yeah. had about a month left when I had my open heart surgery. But the point was is that they're covering something up. Now, mm -hmm. are you going to tell me was it aliens from Zeta Reticuli or whatever? No. What I will say is a declassified document from the British government says we were exposed to UAP radiation. What a UAP is now the classified nomenclature that they use of what we're dealing with. So right. it seems to kind of overlap into each other. I've had, I've talked to people in Congress. I've dealt with the group behind the scenes and I've never even gotten into dealing with how put off Kit Green and all the other stuff that went on to including in my book, which Green openly came out and admitted he helped me through the process, gave a document to the DOD slash VA that was later classified, telling them what, ha what, what, what damaged my heart and openly said that what happened to me was tied up in SAP programs. Those are what he said. Mm -hmm. And that's all in the book where, you know, where he said it. That's incredible. Wow. Well, I'm going to pop up uh, a question. We're going to try to get some uh, questions when we go off uh, KGRA in here just a couple of minutes. So uh, what have you been cleared to say? I thought you weren't told what to say. Uh, so uh, do you understand the question? I guess they're saying, cause I made the comment that if, 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 if in fact there were things that were classified, I couldn't talk about them. Okay. So I have never been told anything was classified up until that letter that was given from, from Dr. Green to the VA and DOD. And there was stuff in it that was deemed classifiable on technology. Okay. So as far as my part of the event itself, I never was ever told I couldn't talk about it other than when the Pentagon called me to tell, to tell me to talk to CNN, they told me to stick to the halt memo and not go off script. So don't oh, wow. go into anything else that wow. happened other than what the memo said. And when I saw the memo, which I kind of got told, I got ordered to talk to him because I just told the Colonel or the general and the captain who happened to be a shift commander at Bentwaters by the name of Graham, who now is in public affairs at the Pentagon, I said, I don't really want to talk to this guy because I don't even know what's going on because I had no clue to how, how it got released news to the world or anything. So when I did meet with Chuck DeCaro, who turned out to be a really good guy, I looked at the memo and I just said, the memo's full of crap. The dates are wrong. The whole story's been jumbled up and everything else. But ultimately, they did not want me to go off the memo other than the memo. So in a way, I was told, not to talk to CNN about anything more than the memo, but I never was told anything in was classified other than this letter that I got later on. Okay, we're going to have to jump off KGRA Radio. Thank you, everyone over there. We'll be back next week with James Fox. Uh, the guest tonight is John Burroughs. We're on. Uh, Dean and I are, are uh, on with him. It's been a pleasure so far. We'll keep going. There's uh, if People may put some questions up in chat. There was one I saw earlier that I'm going to post, so we'll put those up too. Um, so anyway, uh, so all this time has gone by. Are there times that you like you don't want to talk about this? No, no, not really. I just don't. Listen, here's my take. I've turned down a lot of your interviews in the last year or two because I'll tell them I don't want to just talk about generics anymore. You want to read my book, you want to follow the story and understand the story and understand what I relate in my book, I'll do an interview with you because I want to talk about things that matter, not just generic stuff, you know? And I mean, tonight, I'm not, I talked about it with Penniston. Penniston's irrelevant to me, okay? His story is irrelevant. What's relevant to me is I definitely was injured. The government tried to cover it up. They're still covering stuff up to this day about the incident itself, and they're covering up what's really going on, period. And I would like, as a person that experienced something, to have a better working knowledge. Now, do I think I'm going to get that working knowledge? Probably not. They're just going to keep it all locked down in classifications. 
but I can't help but tell you I'd like to know, you know. What is in your in your best estimation? Because uh, you know, so far no one in this event, uh, and it's and it it's, it seems to be intentional. Whether it's uh, uh, extraterrestrial coming from extraterrestrials or or the the military, what is what is your estimation of what is going on? What was the purpose of that whole event in your in your opinion? Well, if you go off of Pike's book, Andrew Pike. Um, they were studying this phenomenon. If you go off Condine, it says it should be weaponized. That's why the title of my book is Weaponization of an Unidentified UAP. Okay. Now, the thing is, our government and the governments of the world, not just the American government, love technology, especially if it can be used for power. Okay. It's just plain and simple. It's all about who it's not. It doesn't have to be who you know. It's what you know and what you have at your fingertips that you can use. Okay. So they clearly have been studying this technology or this phenomenon, whatever it is, okay? If you listen to what Lou talked about, some of the other people that supposedly were close to different programs, it's clearly been involved. Harry Reid said immediately after he got the initial brief, he wanted to make the whole thing an SAP program, right? That's what he wanted to do with this whole thing. So the, the bottom line is they're looking at something that, that they're trying to weaponize. What's interesting was after I got my settlement, when McCain was still alive, the same people who were involved helping with my settlement went straight to McCain's committee, who he was the chair of, and were trying to get funding for exotic technology development. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Here's those a- were those DIA documents. Remember they got they were McCain's committee. McCain was the one that got read into my whole case because of the way it was handled. And at one point threatened to open up hearings when they were still trying to deny my, when they withdrew their um, offer the first time, he said, either this gets taken care of or I'm going to do hearings. So after I got my settlement, he, they then went to him for funding for exotic technology. You tell me. His name comes up a few times in the, in the UAP UFO topic over the years. He's, he's up, he's chimed in more than once, more than your particular case. I can't right. tell you what, but I have heard heard it. He was the- asked on, on one of the local radio stations in Phoenix about it, and he said that it deserves a closer look, I think is what, what he was asked about one time. I know he said that. But yeah. uh, again, I try to go back and be clear about this. It appears we had a contact with the UAP out there. Now, was it all that UAP whatever driven or was it something we were doing to the UAP, which is what Andrew Pike stated was going on. So was there a combination of both? I do know that I was brought into a a hundred people group to have my DNA tested with these other 99 people that was being done through government funding, which that results had never been released. And there was also some of those special operations people that had an encounter at Bradshaw, not Bradshaw, I'm sorry, uh, Skinwalker Ranch. So I was logged into that. I do know they wanted to do an MRI, which they've done on people that have had encounters with UAPs, but because of my pacemaker, they couldn't justify it. Oh, yeah. And then they also wanted to look at, the, the last thing they were looking at was hypnosis itself and what the mind remembers clearly and doesn't, what's, you know, interfered with. Was Gary Nolan involved in any of that? Yeah, Gary Nolan and Colin Keller were brought down to Flagstaff to try to talk me into giving up my DNA for the study originally. Ah, how about that? Here's a question that um, I think is actually a pretty good one. Have you ever had any other other UFO sightings or strange things happen since that? Uh, I've always said no up until when I moved to Sedona for two years, had some weird stuff happen up there. Well, that's uh, your fault that realize. you went to Sedona, Arizona. That's your fault. Well, I'm just saying, when I went out over the Bradshaw Ranch area on three different occasions, some weird stuff took place. Interesting. Can you tell us? Strange uh, lights in the sky and stuff like that that couldn't be explained. Wow. When I, when I showed up out there with a couple other people, some weird stuff happened. But I can't verify it, unfortunately. The one person will never come forward. The other person passed away. But there was some strange stuff that happened on three different occasions out there, so. Interesting. 
Um, I would really be curious to, to see what are the, the similarities with the rate type of radiation that you received and other experiencers uh, have received people that have witnessed um, craft before. Well, if you go back to when these guys got involved, terahertz wasn't a big deal, but all of a sudden they wanted terahertz out. So it has something to do with terahertz, it appears. Hmm. That's, that's as much as I can say because they went out of their way to introduce the public to terahertz radiation. Here's an interesting question because I've heard things are happening. Are you aware of things that are still going on today? Um, people are still going out in the forest and seeing strange lights. Yeah, I've heard I've heard that, and I've heard that there's um, people have talked about cryptids and weird other weird happenings, not just UFOs in that area. I don't know if you've ever heard any any bit of that. Um, I, since since I, I was over there in eighteen, I really haven't spent a lot of time, you know what's been going on since 18. So it may be, I, I don't know. I just, I went back over there one more time in 18 and then I kind of, I wouldn't say I've lost interest in all this, but I'm bored. <laughs> yeah. Now, do you um, communicate with the other people on a regular basis that were involved? Is there, is, or do you kind of just all keep to yourself as far as you know? Um, occasionally I've talked to Adrian, um, other than that, no. Kabansak, I guess after he did the James Fox stuff, the IRS came after him, and he just didn't want to talk anymore. Um, so, <laughs> I mean, because we try, I, at least I shouldn't say we. I tried to get him in the book, and he wouldn't do it. So yeah. people brought that up too. Why wouldn't he in the book? He didn't want to be in the book. That's the one thing more scary than the Men in Black is the IRS. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Especially <laughs> if you've done something wrong, and I'm not implying he did. But if you're squeaky clean, whatever, I guess they can create something. Yeah. Have so. you ever spoken with, because I know that whenever I've, I've talked to people that have come out recently uh, in, in, um, in the press about this, that they start getting people that come to them. And it's the full spectrum of people that are saying, I know the truth of what's going on to, hey, I was at another base and this happened as well. So I'm curious. Was there anyone else that said, hey, I was stationed at this other base. Same type of thing happened to me. Did anyone come to you and share uh, Well, from the time Bentwaters got out in 92, I was in until 2004, actually six, but technically I stopped doing any duty work in four. Um, there's different people that came up with different things. Yeah, they'd come and approach me on different things that they saw and what had happened and stuff like that, yeah. How close were they to your own experience? Um. Not really. I mean, if you take the whole enchilada, I mean, they just saw strange things, you know, stuff, mm -hmm. but not, you know, I guess you could say we saw strange things, but, you know, not really the aftermath. I mean, honestly, Rendlesham is only a big deal because according to Dr. Green, it slipped out. It never should have gotten out. There's a lot of stuff that's happened in the military over the years that's never saw the light of day, but Rendlesham got leaked out when that memo got released you know, released by third air force. So. Yeah. I wonder for every one Rendlesham, how many other cases like this are still buried? I would say there's quite a few that, you know, if you go back from the forties going forward, there's, but you know, I, I don't know if it involves as much drama as Rendlesham did as far as the, you know, over more than one night, the closeness and everything else. I mean, there's no doubt you've got what their airplanes picked up. You know, the fighter jets picked up is, you know, that's there. And I'm sure there's plenty of camera, gun camera stuff that's there. Because why else would they say they're not going to release any more of it? You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's if they didn't have anything else, they wouldn't really have anything to hide, now, would they? There was supposed to be a 23-minute movie, you know, film to come out, Lou Alessandro was saying, and it like it was going to come out soon, and it's never happened yet. I'm not sure what what the deal is with that. I don't know. That you, that's why I'm bored. I mean, listen, I, 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 here's how I kind of want to sum up how I look at things. <laughs> it's 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 just a cutthroat world. I mean, Lou just took a swipe at ufology what a month ago. Just basically, just tore them apart. Some of it was valid. Some of it wasn't. Oh, and like it needs to be rebuilt, torn down and rebuilt or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Who is he to say what 
that. You know, I'm sorry. I, I know the guy. I've met with him. I've talked to him on numerous occasions. He's that's arrogance. That he has no right to tell people what they can and can't say. It's it's up to an individual to believe it or not believe it. You know what I mean? And and so that it's a cutthroat world. There's a lot of crap that comes out. That's crap. I mean, and it shouldn't be that hard for people to disseminate from crap and real stuff. You know what I mean? But the the bottom line is the thing that annoys me the most is disclosures right around the corner. It's been right around the corner since <laughs> December of 2017. It's now coming up on December 22. Oh, lesson key, 2023. How much you want to bet me it doesn't happen in 2023? Well, it's a long block that you have to turn the corner around because it's, you know, it's right around there. Oh, it's a long block, all right. <laughs> and let me tell you, these people that are hiding this, they've been doing this for a long time. And nothing personal, Leslie, but you don't you don't have the wherewithal to deal with these type of people. And I'll tell you truthfully, I wouldn't want to deal with these people because they're hiding it for whatever reason. Obviously, it's national security and the fact that they're working on it or have developed weapons and everything else. I have a FOIA from the British government that said, yeah, We've developed technology off of the UAP, but they're not going to release this. And those are the kind of things that you start going down that road. You can get yourself into some serious issue problems with them. I mean, look, they openly don't cooperate with Congress and the president of the United States when they deem it necessary to keep it classified. The president can order it to be declassified and they can tell them no and get away with it. Yeah. To, to, um, to, I guess, Leslie Kane's defense, there have always been people that you have contacts and stuff, and they'll come out and they'll say things like, it's coming, it's coming, and then it doesn't happen. It happened with the producer of that UFO documentary that came out in the 70s. Um, and UFO cover up live? Yeah. No, no, no. I oh, was... God. Not that one. Not that one. That was the okay. 80s. But the one in the 70s, which was a film that... that um, you talk about Bob Ebenegger. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Where he was promised I know, this. I know Uncle then, Bob real well, yeah. Yeah, then last minute, supposedly, it gets yanked and everything. And, and I feel like yeah. that's kind of part of how the government works, where they'll give you this card, and then they'll yank it away, and you're left standing there going, uh, 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 and, and that's not good. It doesn't look good for you. And some of that's intentional, I think, to kind of you know help discredit. It gets really mucky, and I think that that whole thing, I mean, it's the Richie, uh, uh, Richard Doty factor. Hmm. Well, the interesting factor about all this is this, okay? I'm going to sum it up in my opinion. How much do we know about national security? Can you guys answer me? How much do we really know what's going on right now? Very low. What, what weapons we have, what hmm. capabilities we have. We know the gen generic stuff. We know we have an F-18. We have a stealth fighter. We have this stuff. They, they leak certain things out about the capabilities. A lot of times they do that to get the attention of a foreign government or to get Congress to provide them more money, right? So there's no difference in whatever we're dealing with is the fact that they want to know more about it and they want to weaponize it. So they have to go to Congress to get the money, supposedly, if you, you know. Right. Congress is supposed to give them the money for the development of weapons systems. So there are people that are high up inside and have these clearances that are going to get read in on certain things. And they're going to make a decision based off of what not only the intelligence agencies want, the military wants, and what Congress is willing to give. But none of the stuff that's important in any aspect, forget UAPs, is ever going to come public. They're not going to go into the inner workings of how radar works. Right. They're not going to go into their workings, how these missiles work or anything else. So why are they going to tell us anything about what's going on with the UAP? John, do you think the I'm talking about your particular case you were involved in the Rendlesham Forest. Do you think the government knows a lot more about what was happening or do you think it's a mystery to them, too? Um, I would say that you have those papers that they declassified that the DIA gave to McCain. Um, they're definitely working on exotic technology. The fact that that question was asked, have we developed technology off of UAP and they wouldn't answer it. The easy answer would have been no. 
no, nope, we got to talk behind the closed doors. So yeah, there, there's scientists and people working on all this. Yeah. And do they know more about it than us? Sure they do. Well, the big question is how much do they want to share? I don't know. I mean, what would force their hand? People say, well, a major encounter. Well, there's been stuff that's happened. You have the gun footage from the two different aircraft carriers. You have the Phoenix lights. You have different incidents, different testimony. Has that changed anything? Hmm. Has it really changed? Really? Even you talked about James Fox's movie. What has that changed? Oh, the public watches it just like they watch any other movie. Oh, that's interesting. But there's no there's no real verification or or from the government itself. And as long as the people of the world believe the government has the final say, directly or indirectly, because they allow it, there's never going to be anything about it that's going to actually be settled. Yes, I love playing the disclosure game because it is a game, right? Um, you go, okay, well, what does disclosure even look like? Um, well, I think in, in the UFO community, and it might be a little bit different than, than the general public, but basically they can agree on it. It is when they, the government comes out and says, yes, we've had relationships with them. Does it mean that we've been visited or there have been crash UFOs or that there is some kind of agreement you know, between the two uh, races or other races and stuff? Is it that? Or is it that, you know, uh, is it, is it that disclosure does happen, but it happens to individuals like yourself, like experiencers, the abductees? It's happening to them up close and personal. So is it happening to the people that it needs to happen? But ultimately, whenever I play this out, as much as I want to see this, and I write movies that, are, that play it out, um, I, I always hit this one stopping point, which is, so they come out and they say, here they are, and they land on the White House lawn. And, they, and we see them, and this is all playing out, you know, if this is the, the, the best version of disclosure, right? They come out, climb down the ramp, and then we see them. And then everyone goes, okay, well, this is all CGI. This isn't real. This is all manufactured. It's a red flag, a false flag, et cetera. Then, then they have the alien go, one of the aliens or two of them, go on a whistle stop tour. So you can see up close and personal. What does that get? Oh, well, that's just something that's been engineered. You can always counter all these things, but ultimately, how does that affect who we are? And, and the one thing that I always ask people when they say that disclosure is coming and they're banging that drum hard, I say, Why? Why do you want disclosure? What are you hoping to get from that? If you're hoping that they're going to come and clean up all of our problems, well, those were our problems. Hmm. We need to clean them up. Well, yeah, but let's take it a step further. What if Please. the cleanup on aisle 12 isn't what we want? <laughs> you know, like, okay, yeah, well, we'll step in now, but you're not going to like it. Yeah. Uh, we're not, we're, we're, you've given up your rights, you know, and, and, and now this is the way it's going to be. So, I mean, here's the thing, guys. I mean, <laughs> at the end of the day, it's great. Okay, I'm not one of these guys that's a hater on most everything that's come out. And what I mean by that is there's some wild stories out there that are wild stories. And if somebody wants to believe it or follow it, good for that. So good for you. You told that people believe you, whatever. But I think the thing that annoys me about all this is when they keep making promises that never come true. Yeah. Wait till next year. Yeah. Wait till next year. Bob Bigelow, I think, was about the most sincere person about all this when he did the interview with George Knapp several years ago when he talked about confirmation. He said, we're going to get to the point where it's going to be more openly talked about. There's something going on and we're going to stop right there. And we're not going huh. to go any further with it. We're not going to go into the nuts and bolts of it. And that's kind of where we're at right now. The yeah. media is taking it more serious. Good for them. They've done that. I'm not just taking that away from them. Um, the uh, They'll talk about it more openly. But there's never been any seriousness done as far as on the media end. Not saying they didn't. They did Project Alito now, right? So they're working on something. There's some stuff going on with Lou and NORAD, right? That's what Danny Sheehan said, okay? So there's stuff going on behind the scenes. But people need to realize, number one, this is all being watched over or funded by the government and they control it. So what's going to make them tomorrow change their mind about everything? Eh, you know, and, and then what I don't like is the teasing, mm -hmm. you know, I know it, it, it keeps you valid. It keeps you on radio shows. It keeps you, um, you know, it keeps you in the news, 
But ultimately, I said all along, Two the Stars was a media uh, company because they could lie. And I'm not saying they did, but they attacked the law and stuff about doing things that weren't proper. Under entertainment, it's a whole different way you can approach things, number one. And number two, they now control the narrative, whether people like it or not. And so the thing is, is that stop making promises that your checkbook can't cover. Right. Well, I, I love the, the thing that you said, which was um, that uh, no one really ever does anything without something in return. That's a really good point. I've not really uh, taken that in before the way that you phrase that clean up an island. Aisle 12 is going to come up with some other things. It's not going to be a straight across thing. It usually comes with something. That's what we do. I mean, the conquistadors, when they came over, they didn't say, hey, here's some cool recipes or some stuff. It's we're going to take the gold. You don't think it's that valuable. We're going to take it. And we're going to do this and that. So it, it always is that trade off. I'm, I'm always kind of like, be careful of what that, you know, would look like a full um, disclosure. Um, are we ready? I mean, when we create technology, when we can go out and meet them halfway, then it's then it's an equal footing. But I would imagine we are millions, possibly of years away, at least hundreds of thousands of years away. We could be, I mean, okay, I'll give you an example I always like to use. Did you see the movie Final Countdown? Yeah. 1980. Yeah. They went back to 4042. Yeah, Kirk Douglas. The, the, yeah, but and, the whole, yeah. the difference just in less than 40 years of technology advancement, we don't really know how far we are away from making that big jump. Do you know what I mean? How close we are to AI, quantum, and everything else. It could it could it could accelerate. It could be right around the corner where we could be a lot farther along. The question is, and I say this not because I know or I'm trying to say this is this is what I believe totally, is if there is something else out there that's controlling somewhat of the narrative, they may have a say in how far we can go. They may they may be controlling things. We don't know the ground rules. Because we're the public. We're not allowed to know the ground rules. We right. get lied to all the time. I mean, I'm not trying to bring up COVID other than this. How much have we been lied to about COVID along the way? And just the way the government treated it and the way they handled us and everything else and the way we responded to it. So the point being is all these people sit there and say, we're ready for this. Ready for what? How can you know? Where we're, if I'd have told you that 9-11 was going to happen... Look at the way that went down. Look at the way COVID went down. Look at the way some of the other stuff went down. We didn't handle it very well. Yeah. So why do you think we're ready for some kind of interaction from something else? Did you ever see the Twilight, um, the episode called How to Serve Man? Yeah, to serve man, yeah. yeah. They found us up and they put us on a yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a cookbook. Yeah. Well, uh, that's the interesting thing. There's so many avenues you could go into about how whatever it is can affect what you remember, how you deal with it, you know, what it's doing to uh, manipulating us. Um, there's so many avenues in all this, but the problem is other than some declassified documents that we, some of what we put in our book that we found that there's just a small percentage of people probably in the world that have a, a really working knowledge of what's going on. Hmm. I, and, I believe that. Yeah. And that's power. Whether you like it or not, it's power. Yeah. And so the bottom line is, that's why I'm bored. Maybe, maybe, maybe I will find out. I don't, I would, I'd say I've got a better chance of whatever it is coming back again than I do my government telling me the truth. Huh. Yeah. Here's a, a question. And I asked this person, they said that you may have spoke about this before. Um, can you speak on the plasma conscious link with the craft? Is that something you've talked about before? Well, it's been touched on in the book, and um, it appears that consciousness is the new weapon. If you really want to look at consciousness, and some of it's come out on TV, and then it was interesting, right after TV show did it, they admitted that we have some of it. Um, they We now have drones that can be independently controlled by AI. So they just talked about the drones that can hover over a target for hours, identify the target, and hit it. Well, consciousness seems to be 
any kind of weapon or anything out there can be shut down from ground air. Do you understand what I mean? EM, the frequencies can be modulated and interfered with, right? Hmm. But if you understand how to manipulate something through consciousness, you could control a whole armor garden, armor garden of weapons and stuff, and it would be really hard to stop it, you know, just like drones and everything else. And Northworth Grumman showed a video that I don't know if it's still out there, but the F-35 helmet, the pilot has a, the ability to control the aircraft through the helmet, which is using AI with his mind and stuff outside the aircraft, like missiles and other drones and stuff. So the new weapon is understanding consciousness itself. And the plasmas, um, according to Condine, they're real and they're intelligent, they're under intelligent control. So mm. it and a step further, the plasmas themselves could be the new life form. It could be just an energy form with con being the consciousness energy form itself. Yeah. It could it may not be no longer need to be in a human container. I think I had someone else on the show that kind of spoke along those lines. I was trying to understand the whole thing. It's very well, it's being looked at. I mean, to sit there and say how far we are, I'm not sure, but just the fact that there are people like Musk and stuff coming out threatening that AI could be our demise, you know what I mean? And yeah. and and eventually the the one of the ways you could control everything is imagine if you could take somebody's consciousness, take it out of the body and put it in the computer. Hmm. Or put it in a drone or something. Yeah. Isn't that what happened to Mark Zuckerberg? <laughs> <laughs> um it's interesting because when you're talking about consciousness, uh, you can't help but wonder, you know, um, are we also talking about overlapping of the soul? You know, what is the consciousness? Is, is it th our thoughts or is it something else, um, you know, more powerful, the 21 grams when someone well, passes no away? Well, Nolan was looking, Nolan and his group were looking at consciousness. Yeah. They were so looking St at Stanford's mind. always been yeah, pioneers but, but in the, that. But not only that, they, they're looking at DNA for a reason, okay? Yeah. They're looking at bloodlines, and they're looking at how they've transitioned over the years, why certain people can do things that other people can't, how to develop those abilities, and where are we going into the future? Where will we be advanced? They're already looking at weapons 50 to 100 years in advance, think tanks are. Oh, it's, just, it. it's just yeah. a fact. Yeah. I mean, you could go back to think tanks in the 50s and 60s. We're talking about where we're at today. Hmm. So that's what they're doing. And so consciousness plays a huge part in it. Interesting. Here's a, a, a question of, of what we were talking earlier on, talking about. Uh, you, ha you have to have read the memo, It Makes No Sense. Why weren't jets scrambled if the UFOs were visible for three straight hours? I mean, the interesting thing is, is that at that point, I'm not sure where they would have scrambled them from. I don't know. I can't tell you what base they would have had fighters on alert. I would assume they had something on alert at Lake and Heath. Um, and then over in, in, in Europe, they supposedly somebody, some pilots came forward and said they were scrambled from the continent, not from England themselves. Hall, yeah. Hall, this is just the story that came out. I, You'd have to look, dig into it. There was a couple of guys that said, they were the 16s were I think it was 16s that were scrambled at some point from Denmark or something I don't remember, but what I exactly where but there was a couple of pilots that said they were sent. Um, what I do know is that the 67th should have been activated and there were reports of helicopters being in the air. I talked directly in email with the 67th Air Commander years later, and he wouldn't either confirm or deny if they were involved. Hmm. Dean, you have a question? Well, um, I'm looking for questions right now myself uh, in the chat. So yeah. let me just say something quickly. So anyone that wants to post your question, please do it. Oh, let me bring one other thing up to that point. Please. The command post and um, what was his name? Nick Redfern got a FOIA through the British government to admit our command post at 0320 on the morning of the 27th. I think it would have believed they confirmed through FOIA that our, our command post called Eastern Radar for verifications of UFOs over our area. So there was stuff going on back and forth 
to the command post in different, you know, different agencies. I don't know if they scrambled aircraft or not. That was something that was never discussed. And if they were, we would never have probably known about it. At least I wouldn't have. The chain of command above would have. Hmm. Well, the most powerful commodity in any uh, government is secrecy. So oh, yeah. wh why would they, you know, that, that well, if you don't ask, them, if you if you jumble up the dates, times, and everything else, it takes years to get clarified. You put out crazy stories, and you have different people that are discredited. Eventually, you have infighting going on constantly with Colonel Halt and other people. Now, Pennison and him are fighting. Um, believe it or not, uh, Halt completely went after him last year at the MUFON conference. He did forty-five minutes of his presentation on why the binary everything's a fraud. Okay, so. That constantly goes on. It's really hard to get move anything forward with the case itself and ever get to any kind of closure. Never mind you're fighting the government itself. So I remember saying way back when I started this show in 2011 or whenever, um, I don't know if I said it then, but it seems like such a convoluted case um, because of the different things going on here and, and, um, and, and what you mentioned just now. Right. And I still feel feel that way. Um, and I like the direct approach. I feel comfortable with what you're talking about. Right. Yeah. Next uh, question. Yeah. This question here. Uh, did I believe you spoke about it. They want to do an MRI. Um, I don't know. Well, it's, it's it, people need to understand. But a lot of our military is no longer military per se. It's government contracts. OK. Or uh, consultants like. The people that work with me were consultants for the government. At one point, CIA, DIA, they all worked for these agencies, but they no longer do. They're consultants for them, which gives them a bigger um, span of out of FOIA and everything else. And 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 you can't get FOIA through because if you ask the military, were they involved? No, 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 we weren't. You know what I mean? And all you have to do is look at Afghanistan. At the end, before we pulled out, we had 5,000 troops over there and 15,000 contractors. What does that tell you? It's all hidden inside government contracts now. So, yes, there was government interest in me through contractors. It's so ironic because before World War II, um, FDR had battled all of the big businesses, right? And they, they had the New Deal and how it separated that monopoly, everything. And then when World War II happened, we were so not not prepared, unprepared. It was insane. And all of a sudden, Ford, all these companies, they were they were given back all of these freedoms of control that they didn't have before. And once that happened, as Eisenhower is uh, often quoted, you know, the military industrial complex came in to, to power. And now it's, um, you know, well, actually, it's, it's further. It's a national security state now. But yeah. 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 And so it's, it's just interesting because here we are looking at this and and it's attached to such a huge apparatus it's just not as clean as as the public i think would like it to be in its understanding of well how well you guys asked why this goes on okay every one of these people and i'm not one of them and when i say this i'm not a government agent and i don't like a lot of things the government's done including the way they treated me right i almost died but all these people have their own agenda whether it's like, for example, these guys that are working for the government, which, by the way, how can you be a whistleblower and still be working with the government? That was one of the things I challenged about Lou. And and she had openly admitted it, and they didn't like it. And even Jimmy Church afterwards kind of told me, well, you know, we don't really want to dwell on that. Why not? How can he be a whistleblower but working for the government still? You know what I mean? So the government controls all this stuff. And then all these people in ufology are making money off of it. They have their web pages, their own agenda for the further their careers, their radio shows. Nothing against you, Martin. I mean, it's it's your it's your business and your Tuesday, but ultimately you have to top the latest story. Whatever the last press release to stay relevant, you have to top it. Or you're no longer usually relevant anymore. Or you have to get really good guests on, like Martin, you're going to have James Fox on next week to talk about his movie. But what I'm getting at is these guys all have their own agendas and they don't work together and they, they counteract because from the start, when I first got drug into this, I could see everybody wanted to be the one to be the one to break the story. 
hmm. to get the credit for the story. Yeah. And it's yeah. a joke. You're never going to get the story. Is this the point where you're going to give us a big mic drop? Is that what you're setting us up for right now? Then I'm going to tell you what's going on? <laughs> yeah, no. That you're going to give yeah. us that. <laughs> In fact, I, and now so I don't get any weird questions. I'm honest. I, I really don't know what we're dealing with. I have some ideas. I have some documents, like the guy that asked the question about consciousness and UAP. I have stuff for my for my uh, hypnosis, but I don't have access to this stuff like like a Nolan does, like a Green does, like a Put Off does. I know these guys have access to it. I don't know about Lou. I don't know what he has access to. We've never. I don't think it's ever been verified who he really is. And what I mean by that is not to say that he's lying about anything other than just we know we have the history on put off and he ran Stargate. We can prove that Green was in the CIA and he's done these different projects. You know, we can prove that Nolan works for Stanford and he's involved in this. But all I'm getting at is, is that they know a lot more and they're not talking. Mm -hmm. They'll give you little things that half the time you walk away more confused from what they told you than what you thought you knew when you first talked to them. And those guys aren't at the tip of the spear either. There's people above them buried in government that know a lot more. Oh, John, um, we're, we're going to be wrapping up here pretty soon. But Good. when this happened, um, did you hear other people talking about things on the base, you know, quietly between you? In other words, like the beams coming down on the weapon storage area, uh, other things that you weren't aware of yourself? I um, basically I lived up base, so I was out there for the dorm scuttlebutt and all that other stuff. And I really didn't want to press it. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you, you can tell when when your command tells you to, we'll, we'll let you know. And I yep. was an E3. I didn't have access to even like a Peniston or above, whether or not they were talked to and all that. You know, I was just a little worker bee. So I, there was no reason for me to ask questions or talk about it. Very good. Well, I really appreciate it very much. It's been a great show. It's been a real pleasure talking to you again. Right. Good yeah. talking to you. And nice meeting you for the first time, John. And nice I, meeting you, Dean. And Dave Altman, yes, I have been compared and heard that uh, that I sound and look like uh, uh, Jeff Goldblum. Uh, and when I see oh. you in person, I'll do my impersonation uh, okay. of him. That was Fair an enough. important question we didn't get to, John, okay. unfortunately. Uh, and guys, good <laughs> luck with this. Good luck with this. And and I, I, I'll never say never that I won't, my interest won't get peaked again. But there's nothing going on right now that leads me to believe that there's anything of value other than, yes, maybe the press will talk a little bit more about it stuff. There's nothing on the horizon that I can see. And I could be surprised. I've been surprised before that a value that's going to really make me sit up and listen. So and that's me personally. But keep doing what you're doing. You never know. Yeah. All right. You take care, John. Yeah. Take care, guys. Thanks, John. Yeah. Whoops. So uh, we'll be back next week. Dean, I want to thank you again for uh, covering and helping me out tonight. Um, it's been been a real pleasure. You've been a lot of fun. Well, so. uh, ha thanks for having me here. And uh, it's so great to see you. And uh, uh, you, you, you crushed it. Terrific job. And uh, looking forward mm -hmm. to seeing more episodes with Morton. <laughs> all right. You take care. All right, everyone. We'll be back next week with the James Fox. Thank you all. And keep your eyes to the sky. Thank you.